Hello everyone and welcome to our presentation today. This is Tax Taxmageddon. We've got some really large changes happening in our United States Income Tax Code and really impact us as business owners and investors. And I congratulate everyone uh, for taking the time today to really get educated on how these changes apply to you. This is uh, professional real estate investor David Campbell from HassleFreeCashflowInvesting.com and we have a terrific faculty today who are really experts in uh, understanding the tax code and helping us uh, understand how to use that tax code to our advantage. So what today's about, uh, getting into relationships with people that can help you improve your business, uh, Keystone CPA and UDirect IRA are two vendors that I have been very successful using and they've really helped my real estate development business and real estate syndication business and investing uh, go to the next level. And so we're, I really appreciate working with them and creating educational content for our listeners and our, and our clients. So just want to make everyone feel comfortable. This is not a sales pitch. There is nothing uh, for sale today. Uh, this is really just an educational event and an opportunity to get into relationships with people who might be interested in using our services at some point in the future. So three different companies. We each have our own unique specialty in terms of what we bring to the table in terms of business, financial, and tax consulting. Um, but we also want to make it clear that this is not uh, legal or tax advice. This is really an educational event, and we're all here to learn and figure out how to apply these ideas to make our businesses more profitable. So. What we do is really try to understand what we do at Hassle Free Cash Flow Investing, I should say, is help our clients create an assessment of their financial goals, specifically their real estate investing goals. Help the clients assess their resources, put a strategy together to, uh, to achieve those goals, and then we help the clients go into the tactics and implementation of those goals. When you're putting your strategy together, it's so important to understand the tax consideration of that. And we can work with our clients to really think through some of the considerations for tax, but ultimately everyone's tax situation is unique. And that's where you need to have a strong tax advisor on retainer to really understand when we put a particular investing strategy together, how that strategy will impact ourselves uh, in our unique tax situation. So I'd like to introduce, uh, at this time, we'd like to introduce Matt and Amanda from Keystone CPA. I've had the pleasure of working with them for almost a year and been really, really uh, smart, knowledgeable advisors really understand what my challenges are as a real estate investor and have really encouraged them uh, to bring this message of these upcoming tax changes to our clients uh, so our clients can be really, really prepared with how drastic the 2013 tax changes are and hopefully together we can come up with some strategies to make that uh, tax burden uh, less upon you. So welcome to our call today. Matt McFarland and Amanda Hahn. Thanks, David. Really appreciate it, and uh, it's great to be here. And we would we're looking forward to kind of providing all hopefully all this great valuable information to everyone. Yeah, and before we start, I would just want to make sure we're clear. Uh, you know, the, like you said, David, there are a lot of tax changes coming up, um, none of which are good as it currently stands. Uh, but it's, I mean, today's conversation is going to be more than just the doom and gloom. We're also going to be going over, in, in addition to the tax changes, some strategies. Um, because that's really what is on everyone's mind, is we know taxes are going up, but what can we do to protect ourselves? Um, so we want to start with going over uh, some of the statistics. Um, currently, as it stands, with the low tax rate, uh, ABC News came out, and this was even actually a few years ago, uh, that said that the average American spends more money in taxes than they do in food, clothing, and shelter combined, um, which is really, really incredible if you think about it. Um, but really, you got to see, well, you know, how do they come up with that statement? 
Yeah, I mean these are the these are the numbers behind the statistics. So right here you can see we're just showing you what the current rates are for 2012 and what they're going to go up to in 2013 in what is it less than five months now. So yeah. you can see that the highest federal income tax rate is set to go up by about 4.6 percent. Uh, you know, if you happen to be lucky to live in a state like we do in California, it's got a high high state income tax rate of 10 percent. You've got capital gains taxes to look at. If you work for yourself or have your own business, you've got to think about payroll taxes. A state tax environment totally changing. So it's a lot of things going on, a lot of movement. But, uh, you know, the big thing here also is one big takeaway is, okay, they're, right, they're raising current rates, but what are some other, quote, unquote, politically correct ways to increase taxes besides just raising the rates? Yeah, they're taking away a lot of uh, deductions, uh, phase outs, um, changing in the in the, in the tax brackets, and those Credits. are those are more stealth ways, if you will, of essentially increasing our taxes. Because a lot of times when you hear politicians talking, and you're hearing a lot right now uh, in the media, is people are talking about tax rates, increasing tax rates. But a lot of what you're not hearing about is is all the technical stuff that's within the the tax code in terms of what what are the other takeaways that the government is looking at from a deduction side. And one of our favorites, um, well, not favorites, but favorite topics of discussion, which I, I know on today's call we have uh, a lot of people who are interested in, in growing their wealth and investing in real estate. So there's actually two brand new taxes. And when we say brand new, we mean completely brand new, just something that was thought up by uh, the IRS. Uh, there's two new taxes. The first one that we want to talk about, for any of you who are cur either currently investing in real estate or plan on investing in real estate um, or actually investing in anything in general, okay, if you want to use investment as a way to grow your wealth, which we always recommend you do, right, because you can't just be, you know, working yourself to death to build your wealth. Um, this brand new tax that's coming out is called the Unearned Income Medicare Contribution Tax. Now, I know that's a, a long title there. Um, and it's very misleading because um, typically when you look at it, you don't really know what that is. You know, what, what does it mean to have a tax on Medicare contributions? If I, if I don't contribute to Medicare, am I not subject to this? Or maybe if I'm not receiving Medicare benefits, maybe I don't have to pay this tax. Well, you'd be surprised. This tax is actually a tax on investment income. And what do we mean by investment income? Yeah, just kind of more, the more frequent ones we're going to see is interest. So if you're, uh, you're a real estate investor, you're investing in trust deeds or notes and you're earning interest income. Or if you're not a real estate investor, you just, you know, are, are someone who, who wants to put your money in the bank or buying savings bonds. I mean, these are interest income right. or any type of interest could potentially be subject to this 3.8% unearned income Medicare contributions tax. <laughs> Say that again, huh? <laughs> also, uh, dividends, uh, royalties that you'd be earning, um, rents, uh, that's a big one for our real estate investor clients. Uh, gain on sale of real estate, uh, if you're going to sell your rental property, the gain from that could be applied to this. Uh, if you sell your primary residence and you actually have taxable gain from the the primary residence, that could be subject to this new tax. So there's a lot of things. And another big one is just income from passive activity. So you happen to, like Amanda was talking about, you happen to be invest, maybe you're an entrepreneur, you invest in multiple businesses that you're not, you know, let's say you're not actively involved in the business, but you're just receiving distributions every year, profit distributions. That profit could be subject to this new tax as well. So basically they're just kind of getting across the board on what are people investing in, and can we can we tax some of the three point eight percent on that? Mm -hmm. And this is in addition to the capital gains tax and the income tax that we talked about uh, earlier on a pre on a previous slide. Now, one thing to keep in mind here, as we as you can see on the slide, is that this does affect taxpayers with only taxpayers with adjusted gross income if you're single over two hundred, or if you're married over two fifty. So, obviously, in that example, there is a marriage penalty here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously if you're not, if your AGI is below 200000 or two fifty, you know, theoretically you don't need to worry about this, but for a lot of people this is going to be a real life scenario that they're going to have to plan for and strategize for and ways to minimize this tax or get around the tax. 
Yeah, so in short, this is not a tax on Medicare contributions or for people who are receiving Medicare benefits. It's basically just a tax on investment income from various sources that someone would be generating. Um, and later on, we're going to talk about some of the strategies and, and some specifically with respect to real estate, too, uh, on how you can protect yourself from this new tax. Okay, the other one, uh, kind of like... The other brand new tax coming out. <laughs> yes, the evil twin to the Medicare contributions tax is called the hospital insurance tax. Uh, another brand new idea that, was, uh, that came about a few years ago, and contrary to popular belief, it's not a tax that's ta assessed on hospitals or insurance companies. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be nice, yeah. <laughs> this tax is actually assessed on people like all of us here today on this call. Um, it's another 0.9% and affects the same, same taxpayers, uh, single 200000 or above, or uh, Mary filing joint 250 and above. And this, we said this is the evil twin. Uh, the first one we're talking about investment, uh, tax on investment income. This one is taxes on earned income. So what is earned income? Well, it's basically everything that's not investment income, okay? So we're talking about W-2s. Uh, this may impact W-2 earners. If you're a Schedule C, a sole proprietorship, uh, that's also earned income, self-employment income, basically anything that you're doing actively to generate income, uh, you would potentially be subject to this 0.9% on top, again, on top of payroll taxes, income taxes, self-employment taxes that you're paying already. Um, so this is, you know, this is pretty significant. And, and one thing I just, I, I, I want to address, because I, you know, we've spoken to a lot of clients about this. Um, sometimes people say, well, you know, we don't know if that's going to happen yet. It's, you know, potentially happens in 2013, but we'll see what happens with the election. Uh, you know, this might not be something that comes about. Well, currently as it stands, this law is scheduled to take into effect in less than five months. Okay, so in about four months, effective January, this is set to take place. Uh, as far as I, I've seen and kind of following the, the, the media and the elections, this actually hasn't been something that's being addressed. No, it's not. And I really haven't seen anyone trying to, uh, you know, trying to, what's the one, like, re repeal right. this potential tax increase. So, well, you know, the, fun, the funny thing, too, is it, it's getting a lot of publicity recently, but as you mentioned, this is actually a couple years old. They came out with this a couple years. It's just not going into effect until this coming January. So obviously now everybody's talking and thinking about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So between the 3.8% and another 9%, you can see how... 0.9%. Well, 0.9%. <laughs> <laughs> you can see how important it is for us to make sure that we get some tax planning in place. Um, this is a really interesting slide. I just wanted to show, you know, I think a lot of us would be fairly happy with, you know, making half a million dollars of income per year. But if you really take a look at all the taxes you're paying to the IRS, to the state, to the payroll, investors' taxes, capital gains, um, on average, you're left with just a little under $200,000 before you're able to spend your money. You know, before you go to Costco, before you put gas in your car, before you, you know, buy groceries and put food on the table. And so it's really amazing when you take a look at uh, what the cost currently is uh, of taxes. And, you know, when we talk about wealth building, because I know that's very important for, for everyone here today, when we talk about wealth building um, tax, the, the tax drag a lot of times is the biggest hindrance to wealth building because in a scenario like this, if we make five hundred thousand, instead of paying you know two three hundred of it to taxes, if we can use that to invest, I mean that significantly increases the growth potential. I know David, you typically go through an analysis about tax free or tax you know taxable investments, um, and for those of you who haven't seen it before on David's presentations, it's an extremely powerful example that he goes through. You were just showing that we spend almost in that. That case, well over fifty percent of our uh, ordinary income in taxes, and one of the strategies that I'm sure that we ha that uh, the clients should be aware of is that w ordinary income is the worst kind of income there is. And so, yeah. as real estate investors, we're doing our best 
to reclassify our income to be capital gains income when possible, to be tax deferred income through the appreciation uh, of, of a real estate asset, um, having that depreciation shelter reduce our creating phantom losses for us. So when people are looking at how they make money in real estate, um, when they focus on just the ordinary income perspective, that's important, but I really encourage people to understand how they can make money in real estate through tax shelter. And so there's also ways to create shelter your ordinary income through through real estate, where you might actually lower the income tax on your, your salary um, because you own property. And so I'm, there's so much to talk about, and I don't want to slow the momentum of the call down, but that pie graph was just so powerful to me that there's no way you can get ahead in life if you're giving away that much of your money in, in taxes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that you brought up a good point about, you know, if you can, you don't want to convert your ordinary income to capital gains income. I, we, I was just talking to a client yesterday that, you know, currently, for those of you who know, right now the capital gains rate for federal is at 15%, same rate for, for uh, dividends that you earn. So we were talking to a client yesterday that's going to have to take a big dividend from their corporation and just showing the example of, well, you may want to do that before the end of the year because next year that dividend rate goes out the window and for them making $200,000, the rate they would pay on the dividend now is 15 versus next year is easily 35% or higher. So that's, an, that's, an, that's a perfect example of what you're talking about is trying to find the best rate for the money that you're making. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And it's, it, whenever we talk about different types of income, a lot of times just in looking at ordinary income versus capital gains income, you can easily see a swing of maybe 30 to 35 percent from taxpayer to taxpayer. And so, I mean, that's a good transition into our next slide, which is starting out on the strategy side. So we know about the doom and gloom. We know what's coming up. We know who's going to be impacted. Um, so what are some of the things that we should be looking at right now? What are some of the things we should be working with advisors on right now to make sure we're protected? And I think, uh, Matt, you shared a really great example about someone who is maybe considering, should I, uh, you know, if I invested in Apple stocks, I mean, should I be redeeming those now or should I wait until next year? Uh, which one is much better for me? Well, you know, and of course, uh, it depends on the person, but in that specific client example, it would be much better to redeem it this year because right, right now the highest capital gains rate is still only 15%. Uh, next year, it potentially increases to 20%, plus there's another 3.8% of investment taxes. Right, so if you are somebody that is going to be subject to that extra 3.8%, all of a sudden your capital gains rate goes up by 8.8%. So one of the first strategies that we talk to our clients about and always comes to mind is looking at harvesting capital gains. And this could be on the sale of stocks, this could be on the sale of real estate assets, so you may want to look at, does it make sense to sell them this year versus next year or two years later? Whenever you're considering, you know, what the market's going to do and when you think you're going to be able to sell that property. Now, this brings up a good, a, a great thought is that a lot of times we obviously, one of the strategies we always look at for tax planning is can we defer paying taxes as long as possible? Well, this is the exact opposite, right? I mean, you may not want to defer taxes to next year or the year after. I mean, last year, we were working with a client that was selling a property and it was going to close in, I think it was December 15th of 2011. It was a rental property? It was a rental property. And for her, it was going to be about $75,000 of gain. So that was going to be... That's nice. I like yeah, that. It was, a, it was a good profit, but it was also going to, you know, obviously she got to pay some taxes on it. I think her number was about 20, 25 grand, something like that, depending on, you know, her numbers. But so we talked to her last year about, well, you know, if you can delay the close of that property for two weeks to January 1st, January 2nd, that's going to defer the taxes due on that property by an entire year. Now, for her, rates weren't going to change, so the taxes weren't changing, but she'd have a whole extra year to pay that tax. But going back to our example here, this year that strategy may not work for everybody because next year the rates actually might, in effect, go up. You might be paying the extra 8.8% on the same amount of money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what I hear yeah. you saying is one strategy to is we're trying to classify our income in the most favorable tax environment. And so the strategy you're talking about is um, what year do you want to pay it in? Because if you have control over your income, uh, 
as a business owner and an investor, I can choose when I want to get paid. When I'm working a job, I don't, right? My W-2 income gets paid to me every month, and that's it. And so when people are, are saying, oh, the tax laws aren't fair, let's look at, you know, I don't want to politicize, but we can just, in the news right now, Mitt Romney is saying, being criticized because he pays 14 or 15% in taxes, and Obama is paying 20 Five twenty-eight percent in taxes, whatever the numbers are, it's, it's, it's this big difference between the two. And the reason that Mitt Romney is able to legally pay less in taxes is, you know, he's able to use these strategies because he's a business owner and an investor. And mm -hmm. by re choosing what year he wants to take his income, he can actually affect his his tax rate. Yes, definitely. And, you know, uh, another thing to, to bring up, I know, you know, we're talking about either uh, business owners or real estate investors. It's, it's also important for people to understand that as a real estate investor, you are actually a business owner as well. So for the real estate investors, one of the most common mistakes we see is investors not taking or maximizing their tax deductions. You know, so a lot of the common things like um, uh, cell phones or traveling and meals related to the investment, you know, discussing investment options and stuff like that, those are all legitimate business expenses. And so it's really important for, for, for anyone on this call, you know, if you're a real estate investor, you are, in term, you know, at least in, in the eyes of the IRS, for the most part, you're also a business owner and, you know, you might still be working at your W-2 job, you might still, uh, you know, be at home taking care of the kids as well, but you are also now a business owner and so make sure you, you take advantage of these related tax deductions because especially when we're talking about, you know, increasing tax rates, uh, you know, taking a, you know, even writing off $100 could mean you saving 30 40 or even, you know, $50 in terms of taxes. And so, you know, it definitely does start to add up. Um, That's really powerful of, on the first property, especially, because when people are looking at the tax adv advantages of owning real estate, usually they just focus on the depreciation schedule. But let's say you uh, are just working a job, and suddenly you add a property, not only do you get the depreciation schedule of the property, but maybe you can take a portion of your cell phone, maybe you can start writing off some of your investor education, some of your travel, some of your clothing perhaps, some of your home office, maybe some of the cleaning expenses of the, uh, that home office, etc. So you can start getting very creative about assigning expenses that used to be solely expenses in your life, with no deductibility, now you can start to de deduct things that you would have spent anyway. You can start to deduct those because they're uh, usual and ordinary uh, business expenses as part of your real estate ownership uh, business. Yes, that's exactly correct. And, um, you know, talking about investment-related strategies, uh, I just want to give you a sneak peek. You know, later on, we're, a sneak peek? Sneak peek. Later on, we're going to be talking uh, about retirement-related strategies. Um, and we're going to have Karen Hall, who's going to be sharing ways on how you can take control uh, of your retirement money. But going back to gain harvesting, what I love what Matt said about, you know, your ability to sell an investment, you know, pay the taxes now so that you're saving taxes down the road. Um, but I know in speaking with this one particular client just the other day, she has invested in, in Apple stock. And her question is, well, I don't want to sell. I don't want to sell my Apple stocks. They're doing so well. I, I, I want to hold on to them forever. Well, the good news is that, you know, if you sell the stock and you lock in the capital gains to today's rates, there's no limit or, you know, there's no restriction on buying back those same stocks. So you can sell it and immediately purchase those stocks back and they're still part of your investment portfolio. Um, and of course, that same strategy you could use with respect to real estate, although a little bit more tricky, you know, real estate is not something you want to buy and sell <laughs> in a day or two. Um, but definitely do the analysis to see if it makes sense to you. Another strategy that people should be looking at is one where we're talking about shifting income, and this is for business owners and real estate investors alike. Uh, I mean, this is a great, great way to protect yourself from rising taxes and also protect yourself from this from the new investment tax of 3.8 percent that's also coming out next year. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this is a strategy that people hear a lot about, um, but I don't see it actually being implemented 
as often. Um, so I want to kind of maybe share an example of a client, uh, actually a client of ours, we met with her, uh, she's in the real estate business and it's kind of unique, she does fix and flips of mobile homes. And uh, what happened was we met with her, it was actually when we went to their house uh, to meet with her and her husband and was just, you know, chit-chatting and I said, well, where are the boys? Because I know she has two boys in high school. And she said, well, we sent the boys over uh, to one of the mobile homes to have them uh, help us with some remodeling stuff, you know, painting and cleaning up. It was very dirty. The tenant had left it very dirty. And so we said, well, have you, do you pay them? Like, how, I, how are you structuring this? And she said, no. You know, they owe it to us. We give them food. We give them clothing. We give them everything. So they're required. It's part of their chores. And so what we did, we talked to them about, well, if you actually – you know, put them on payroll, incorporated them into the business, what that means is, let's say, for example, you know, you paid your, your son $5,000 per person, well, that means you're getting a $10,000 tax deduction on your tax returns for that year. And if you're going to continuously have your kids help you in your real estate or your business, then you're talking about a $10,000 deduction, if not more, each and every year. And so that definitely adds up. The other way to look at it is, you know, this is probably money you're giving to your kids already anyways, because you're giving them money to go to the movies, you're giving them gas money, you're giving them money to buy back to school stuff. And and you're not taking a tax deduction for it, right? So why not legally take a deduction for it by having them help you out in the business and pay them for the work that they're doing for you? You're essentially moving money from your left pocket to your right pocket, and in the meantime, getting a $10,000 tax deduction. So what you're saying, instead of uh, buying my son toys, I can put him on the payroll, pay him a salary, and let him buy his own toys, and now I've effectively gotten a tax deduction for buying toys for my children. Exactly. And you've taught him something about responsibilities, about business running, about investing. Isn't that great? But hopefully they're in that situation, David. You're going you're gonna to talk to them about the importance of opening up a Roth IRA and then contributing that money instead of buying toys, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, you know, Roth IRAs are just kind of touching up on, uh, on that real briefly. That's actually a really great way, especially for any of you who have younger kids, because think about the tax-free growth potential of that money in a retirement account. You know, you build it up over time. You go out and buy, let's say, a piece of real estate, and uh, you know your kid potentially could be getting tax-free rental income for the rest of his life. I mean, how amazing is that? You know, and he could pull out some of that to use for to pay for college too, and you don't have to worry about limitations of you know 529 plans and all that other mumbo jumbo. All right, so let's go to the next strategy, and this is, you know, we, whenever we do teaching, uh, whether on webinars or, or live, legal entity is always one of the most common questions we get, which is what kind of entity should I be operating through? The first caveat I have to say is that, you know, it depends. It depends on your personal situation. It depends on the numbers, and it depends on what you're doing. What is your business, or what are you investing in? Yeah, and in some situations, you know, it's going to make sense for certain taxpayers to have a multiple entities structure set up. For some people, that's not going to make sense. So just because, you know, your neighbor down the street or the person you meet at the the seminar or whatever has got five entities, that's not going to mean that you need five entities. So you definitely need to speak to your advisor and plan, and plan proactively about what's going to make the most sense. But I wanted to talk about entity structuring today, especially with regards to the increasing taxes. Um, because now for the first time, having different entity structures could make a significant difference on whether or not you're subject to the new taxes. Um, to share an example, I, I was just working with a new client who came to us, and he's in the consulting uh, uh, consulting business. Um, and, you know, he's got a pretty, pretty successful business that he currently has set up. Um, where he's probably generating a close to about $300,000 a year on consulting income. 
Um, he also has a bunch of investments uh, from real estate to land and, you know, just other startup businesses. Just so very, very savvy guy uh, who's, who's great at building his wealth. And so he came to us because he was concerned uh, listening to a webinar, just like how, you know, you are right now. When we were talking about the new taxes coming out affecting people who have over 250000 he said, hey, that's me. That's me. I don't want to pay new taxes. What can I do? So in his situation, we are working with him because he has different investments and consulting companies and all that. We talked about setting up a management company. Um, a lot of times you'll see management companies be set up as S corporations. Um, but because of the new taxes coming out, it actually would be beneficial for him to set up a C corporation instead. The reason being that C corporations pay their own tax rates. And so what that means is if he's able to pay his C-Corp $50,000 of management fees, now all of a sudden his personal income tax goes below that 250 limit. So now all of a sudden he's not going to have to worry about the new unearned income Medicare contributions tax, nor is he going to have to be worried uh, about the new hospital insurance tax. So that's a really powerful concept to, sh to use entities to shift income out of your personal bucket. Well, and also, too, in that example, if he can keep, if someone can keep their income in the C-Corp below $50,000, that's only taxed at 15% for the C-Corp versus mm -hmm. if, in this example, someone's making $250,000, they're probably paying 35%, you know, going up closer to 40% next year for federal. So mm -hmm. there's also that tax rate arbitrage that we can take take advantage of as well. So yeah, I mean, on the fifty thousand dollars shifting of income between the entities, you're talking about you know eight, ten thousand dollars of savings per year. Because um, you know, a lot of times too, when you're talking about tax strategy, you don't only want to look at the immediate savings. You want to look at well, how much is it going to save me each year going forward? So the C corp, you know, a lot of times is, is a great structure for management companies. Another one that I want to bring up with respect to entity is. Uh, LLCs. Um, LLCs compared to S corporations, you really need to take a look at that for this coming year. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just the different ways that they're being taxed. Um, S corporations sometimes could be a better result for those of you who are have an active business or are actively participating in, let's say, syndications or money raising with respect to your real estate deals. Okay, um, but you know, entity structuring is, is is fairly complex. Some of the things to note would be that um, the changes that are impacting you. If you're someone who's over two hundred or two hundred fifty thousand of income, definitely look at ways to use entities to shift a significant portion of that out of your tax return. Another great point that you're looking about uh, use of management companies in managing your various real estate entities. Uh, for example, we're doing this call today from the state of California and the Franchise Tax Board charges $800 per entity per year. And so if you've got four properties out of state, because I don't know why anybody would buy real estate in California is one of the least landlord friendly states in the country but that's a digression if you had four properties in four different states and you had four different entities and you're paying the Secretary of State for each in each of those states you're also if you were personally the manager for all four of those entities you'd have to pay California eight hundred dollars times four right yep but if you and that's go ahead. But if you had a, say that's irrespective of if you make money, lose money, or if you don't even do anything in California. California wants its eight hundred dollars. That's it. But if you had a one company in California that was your managing entity, and that managing entity was the manager of your four out of state properties, so you created an unnecessary entity maybe from an asset protection standpoint, but now you've got five entities instead of four. Only one of those entities is doing business in the state of California, which is your management entity. How many franchise tax fees do you owe? One or five? Well, that's, that's a, yeah, that's a great example. In that, in your strategy, that that's the cool thing is you'd only owe the fee for the one company. And I want to comment. You said, well, now you have an extra entity that you don't really need, except for asset protection. 
I've never spoken with a, an asset protection attorney who said that having more entities is, is not good, right? It's like yeah. the more asset protection you have, the better it is. Yeah, yeah. but in terms of tax savings, you can take a, a $3,200 per year tax bill, bring it down to $800 per year by adding an extra entity. And normally that extra entity makes things more complicated, but in this case, you know, you're saving a huge amount of uh, taxes. And for example, we, we do that as part of our tax strategy. We have multiple entities out of, out of the state managed by our California corporation. And we are very careful that we're not bringing that foreign entity into California. We make sure we do our banking outside of California. That any mail that comes to our office, we want to make sure that it's sent to the name of our uh, managing company rather than to the name of the entity. Because we really... Mm -hmm don't want to do have that entity do business in California because that would trigger another eight hundred dollars per entity right right yes that's a great point and you know I mean that brings us to the next topic which is real estate um, you know in the face of rising taxes I, I for me personally I, I feel that it's even more important to make sure that real estate is one of your investment vehicles um, as compared to the stock market or other traditional investments, real estate is one of the very few that provides you with, like you said earlier, David, uh, tax-free appreciation, and you get to write off depreciation on the purchase price of that property. And so that's a very powerful concept as compared to, you know, the competitors, which is the, the, the typical stock, bonds, mutual fund, uh, commodities. Now, the other thing that we already touched on is real estate investors, you need to make sure you are deducting business expenses. You need to be in the mindset that you are a business owner. And now all these things, I mean, even the fees you're paying to your CPA, I'm sure part of what they're doing is with respect to your real estate business. And so there are better ways potentially to report some of these deductions so that you're able to offset your taxable income. Um, there's a term called the real estate professional status um, and contrary to popular belief this is probably another one of the most common tax mistakes we see to qualify for the real estate professional status you don't even need to be licensed as a realtor there's no licensing required you just have to meet the number of hours of participation in real estate that's required by the IRS so why do we care about being a real estate professional well for those of you who are, you know, quote unquote, higher income earners, meaning you're making over 100000 or over 150000 you have an opportunity to use the unlimited amount of losses or write-offs on the real estate investments to offset your other sources of income, such as W-2 income, Schedule C income, income from your business. And so it's not uncommon for us to see someone with a 200000 or uh, $150,000 income to pay either 15% tax or maybe even zero taxes because they could qualify as a real estate professional. Yeah, we see that all the time. It's a great, it's a great strategy for people to be able to take advantage of it because um, a lot of people don't know about it. Uh, a lot of CPAs they may think they know about it, but don't do it correctly, unfortunately. So. <laughs> Yes, and you know, I mean, to, to think about the ability to to be able to use, you know, all these these legitimate business expenses. I think uh, now that you're a real estate investor, go ahead. One of the things that that made it clear to me because I was trying to understand why the tax code would be that way, and what I figured out is that if you are a passive investor the government, or the IRS rather, is trying to limit your ability to take your passive losses and offset your active income. But as soon as you're a real estate professional, your losses are no longer passive. All of your losses are active. And so you can, of course, take your active losses and offset your active income. Yes, that's exactly right. And isn't it, isn't it amazing how, I, you know, I think for all of us on this call today, our goal is to build wealth right build wealth put our money to work for us so we're not working for our money all the time but the tax code is written to to you know to to, to not promote that it's written to promote uh almost like not investing and instead they want you to actively work for all your income so it, it you know it boggles the mind 
not sure what the thought process is behind that. Um, but you know, the real estate professional is one of those great loopholes where you can use all the depreciation on an unlimited basis to offset all of your W-2 income. Well, the tax code okay. is really designed to reward people for investing, right? Because if you have ordinary income, you're paying at a higher rate than if you have uh, passive income, right? The, the thing that we're talking about is when you have losses, right? The government doesn't want you to take those passive losses to offset your active income because they would lower your tax rate and your your uh, the amount of tax that you would pay, but by uh, encouraging people to, uh, by having that loophole, so to speak, it's rewarding people like me who make real estate their business and who are very active investors, and we've given up um, that addiction called a, a day job, right? I've heard the most addicting things in the world are uh, cocaine, carbohydrates, and a monthly paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can... If you can give up that addiction of your monthly paycheck, you're going to be able to get your income, um, a lot of control over that income. And so, you know, back to that presidential d debate, right? If, if Obama has been working for his income and his income is classified as W-2 income and he's not investing, then his income rate's going to be higher. And when you look at someone whose income tax rate is lower, I generally think that the person who is paying a lower percentage of their income in taxes is probably contributing um, a lot of economic stimulus to the economy because they're investing in, in things. They're putting their money to work in the economy. People who are paying a high tax rate, they just go to work for a living and then they give it all back to the government in, in, in taxes. There's nothing, there's no investing happening. It's true, and it's and it's worth noting too. When we're talking about losses on real estate, obviously we don't want to we don't want to incur losses. But the the point here is that you, with a lot of tax strategies you can put in place, you can actually become cash flow positive on your real estate. But with depreciation, with your home office, with deducting meals and things of that nature, we can actually create a loss for tax purposes. And that's where we want to be able to take advantage of that loss um, to you know. Reduce income from other sources, and that's where the real estate professional status comes in handy. <laughs> Good point. We never want to. We never want to lose money just for purposes of getting a tax deduction. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, if somebody wants to do that, they can send me money, and I'll give you. The, you know, we can give you the tax deduction. <laughs> All right, so um, our next strategy is retirement contributions, and I know a lot of you are anticipating uh, our next speaker, Karen Hall, talk about uh, the, the, how to take control of your retirement account. Just real quick, retirement planning is one of the most powerful strategies that you can use to reduce your taxable income. Um, you know, if you're a business owner or if you are active in real estate, you could potentially you know, stash away up to fifty or even a hundred thousand dollars per year to pay towards your retirement rather than pay the IRS. So definitely something to look into. For those of you who are W-2 employees uh, or high income earners, also look into your opportunity to fund your own retirement account as well. Okay, so just because you have an employer 401k, you might participate in it. That doesn't mean you can't also open and fund other retirement accounts. And so if your goal is to, to save taxes now, have a grow tax deferred, and also use that to invest in other assets such as real estate, for example, definitely make sure you speak to your tax advisor about that because a lot of times people don't know they could have a 401k at work and also open a fund their own retirement account. And um, of course, you know, right now when taxes are still low, this would be a good time to look at putting money into the Roth IRA or Roth 401k. For the first time ever, there's no income limitation to who can have a Roth account, and that again, that's with the Roth IRA and the 401k. Um, but you know, we're talking about okay, how do we put money into our retirement account? And you say, well, great, Amanda, I love that I can put money away, but I don't like the returns. I'm not sure about the stock market. Well, hey, you have options, and there are ways that you can take control of your retirement and invest in alternative assets such as uh, real estate, 
trustees, apartment building, land, all sorts of stuff. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our next faculty, which is the self-directed IRA expert, Ms. Karn Hall. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's great to hear all the, <laughs> about all the taxes. Yeah, tax Mageddon. The self-directed IRA, though, is one way to uh, avoid these taxes, of course, because if you've got a self-directed IRA, your, your proceeds are growing tax-free or tax-deferred, and they're not subject to these new uh, wacky taxes that we've got. I, I love, you know, the Buck Brown taxes. Um, but yeah, so my name is Karin, and I'm the president and founder of UDirect IRA Services. And what we do here is we're, we're a third-party administrator, and we provide self-directed IRA accounts. Uh, we don't give tax advice, which is so great to have Amanda, though, on hand to give tax advice, Amanda and Matt. Um, we also don't give legal advice, and believe me, we get asked plenty of tax and legal questions, and it's such a close call, but you really need to get tax and legal information from, from experts, uh, from, you know, like a, your, I guess, uh, what would you say? You need a collection of, of good advisors. So what we like to do is, is help you self-direct, and we can help you from beginning to end. So if you want to change your slide, we'll move on and, and just say we, we believe you should invest in what you know best. Well, while we're changing slides, I'll mention something. Amanda was talking about the law, but I got a call today, and someone wanted to get a, you know, a solo pay, and they were talking about the law bucket. And I was explaining that with the Roth bucket on the solo pay, the only way to put money in there is to make a contribution. You can't convert money into the Roth bucket, and you can't um, transfer money from a Roth account into the Roth bucket of a solo pay. You have to do contributions. So that's something important to know. And um, the, I think the limit, and Amanda, you can um, back me up on this, I believe the limit is $17,000 to put into that Roth bucket, is assuming that you make enough money, right? That's correct. So this year, uh, if you're someone, if you you know, if you participate in a 401k plan, you have 17,000 that you could allocate between your traditional 401k or the Roth 401k, and it's up to you how much you want to put in each bucket. I see. So yeah, so that's great. So all of these kinds of plans right here can be self-directed, whether you have a typical Roth or a solo pay that has a Roth bucket, a traditional, a Roth, a SEP simple, spousal, even. An inherited IRA that's not on this list, that can also be self-directed. But it's not just IRAs. Um, you know, self-directed IRAs are great, and but there's even more. You can self-direct a Coverdell, which is also called an ESA, or an Education Savings Account. Um, that's a great tool. You can save $2,000 a year toward children's education, and that money can be self-directed. An HSA, or a Health Savings Account, is also something that can be self-directed, where you have um, an HDHP, a high deductible health plan, and you've got to talk to your insurance agent about this, your health insurance agent. Make sure you qualify. But if you do, you put the money in, you get a tax break, the money grows tax-free for life. And as long as you use the money for a very long list of benefits, then, uh, or actually I should say health care expenses, then the money comes out tax-free. So that's a pretty sweet deal. It's even better than the Roth, I think, where the money you know, goes in and comes out tax-free. That's the health savings account. So just know that these are all different kinds of accounts um, that you can uh, self-direct. You know, people will look at our website, and I get this call from time to time, and someone will say, okay, Karen, I'm on your website, and I'm looking here, and it says traditional and Roth and stuff, but I don't see where it says self-directed IRA. So I think that it's important to know that the only difference between a typical IRA and a self-directed IRA is the kind of asset that the plan can hold. The typical IRA is, is going to invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You know, but the self-directed IRA can invest, like Amanda was just saying, in anything except life insurance and collectibles, so it's quite a bit. So let's move on to the next slide. And uh, just to say that there are so many different kinds of uh, opportunities. As long as you're investing and your IRA is investing for investment purposes only and you have no personal use, then you can invest in that. So how do you do this? How do you self-direct an IRA? Um, it's, I, I'd say it's as easy as one, two, three. Um, there are more steps than that. but Basically, there are three steps. Step one is to open an account. Uh, step two is to get money into that account or fund it. And step three is then to invest. So to open an account, you go to our website. That's udirectira.com. And open our application. And, and by the way, the first page of our application is form fillable. So what that means is that you get on there and you see, whoa, that, page, that application is 24 pages long. But if you just type on the first page, it's going to auto-populate the entire application. So it's really just one page that you fill out. 
you give us about six pages of that back. You give us a driver's license. There's a $50 setup fee, a copy of the statement where the money's coming from. And then that's great. Well, say, for example, you have an IRA and you're transferring it. That's one way to do it. But here are the three ways to put money in the IRA. Number one is to write a check and make your annual contribution. Now, people will say, well, Karen, how much can I contribute? And I say, well, call Matt and Amanda because it depends on your age. It depends upon your account type. And it depends upon your income as well. You could make uh, too much to contribute in, in some cases. So ask your tax preparer or tax advisor what um, contribution amount is most appropriate for you. So then you could transfer money. That is from an IRA to an IRA. So a self-directed IRA, a, a typical IRA to a self-directed IRA. Anyway, an IRA to IRA is a transfer. You fill out our transfer form and you sign it. You give it to us and we sign it. Then we send it to your current custodian. And it takes them, right now it's an average of about 16 days to get the money from that current account into your self-directed IRA. But when it gets there, we send you an email. We let you know it arrived. Was it a check? Was it a wire? When is it available for investing? So we've got all that. Now, there's another way to put money in the IRA, and that's called a rollover. And what that, what that is is when you take money from an employer plan, and by employer plan, I mean like a 401k, a 403b, a 457, from a previous employer, uh, you contact their, their um, plan administrator, and then you basically fill out their forms and sign them, and then the money will come over. So those are the three ways to, to fund, fund a self-directed IRA. But once the money is there, you tell us what you want to invest in. You direct your money. So you give us a direction of investment form. That's our form, very simple to fill out, together with the supporting documentation. And that would be the purchase contract. And with that, now we send the money out in 24, 48 hours. And then you have a self-directed IRA that has an asset. So it's, it's a pretty sweet deal. It's open, fund, and then invest. And of course, all proceeds of the IRA go back into the IRA. All right, skipping on to the next slide. Um, I should say while we're doing that that you direct IRA services. We've been around now for three years. Uh, we've opened in excess of 1,100 accounts, and our clients have deposited over $91 million, I believe it is now. So it's, so it's, it's going well. And self-direction is just so popular. It's a great way to take control of the money you have in your retirement account. And make sure that, that you're not a statistic. I, I was in Washington, D.C. in March and learned that, um, the, that there's a $6.6 .6 trillion deficit between what baby boomers have and what they need to retire. So don't be a statistic. Invest in what you know best and self-direct your IRA into assets that you're comfortable with. And if you want our help, please give us a call. That'd be great. Send an email for questions or anything. Hall at udirectira.com. That's my email. The phone number is 866-538-3539. So, One of the great things about self-directed IRA is the ability to hold non-traditional assets, right? If you're just going to be buying uh, and selling uh, shares of Apple, well, then probably any plan administrator would do fine. But if you want to hold any type of a non-traditional asset or a blend of assets, right? Maybe you have some Apple right. short shares and you want a duplex in your IRA, then self-directed IRA makes a lot of sense. And what's... Yeah, maybe gold bullion, maybe notes, maybe real estate, maybe mango trees in the Philippines. It can all go in your self-directed IRA. Yeah. And some people, they, they want to own real estate uh, or they want the benefits of real estate, I should say, but they don't want the hassle associated with being uh, a landlord. And that's something that people can look at is the idea of owning a group investment or a private placement where a company like ours can put together 10 or 15 investors um, to go put pool their money together to go buy a shopping center. And then the the each person owns a percentage of that group investment. In a situation like that, it functions like a stock, right? What they feel like they own the stock, they get a stock certificate just like they owned uh, Microsoft, etc. But they get all of the benefits of owning real estate. They get the cash flow, the appreciation, the amortization, the tax shelter. Even though they're owning it as passively as owning a stock, they still get their pass-through portion of the depreciation associated with that type of a, a passive investment. So we've got the opportunity to do some questions and answers right now. If you do have a question for our faculty, 
uh, you can put it into the chat box right now. If you think of a question later, we have the contact information for our faculty up here on the screen. You can um, uh, send us an email, visit our website. We would love to be in communication with you if you do have uh, a need for our services. And if you just have a question, I encourage you to, uh, to reach out to us. Also, I know that there's a lot of investing and, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of educational material on all of our websites. Uh, Karin, Amanda, and I have a number of video recordings uh, available on previous topics um, related to real estate investing and tax and using your self-directed IRA. And you can find those recordings, those video recordings, on my website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. There's a bunch of great um, uh, educational materials from the faculty. I think while we wait for questions, David, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, obviously it's important to keep our pulse on, on what comes out uh, of this coming election. Um, but really, there's just about four months left before this year is over and the tax changes take into effect. And so what a lot of people may not know is that the best time to to plan proactively to save taxes is actually now um, because you know when you're meeting with your tax preparer or your tax advisor in April at tax time there's very limited amount of things that they could do for you from a planning perspective you know probably just help you to fund five thousand dollars to a, a traditional IRA or something like that all the powerful ones that we talked about in terms of income shifting or entity structuring or opening up a retirement account where you can put, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars in, those for the most part have to be done before the end of the year. And that's same, you know, with if you're if you're on the fence about purchasing real estate as an investment property to generate the cash flow to get the tax savings, the earlier you take action, the more beneficial it is. And so you know, it's, it's, now is the best time to, to take action and make sure that you have uh, the right team and the right strategies in place. A joke that I like to say is in December, it's called tax planning. In January, it's called tax fraud. Yeah, I love that. That's exactly correct. For the most part. <laughs> so we do have some questions that came in. Um, Chris asks us about a self-directing IRA and what types of things uh, can you not invest in through your self-directed IRA and in particular I think he's interested in owning real estate in his IRA and is that permissible? Karin. I'll take that one. Yeah, you bet. Um, well, of course you can own real estate in an IRA and, and that's something comes to the self-directed IRA is even called the real estate IRA. Just make sure that it's for investment purposes only that you're not living in it or it's not a vacation home, it's not, uh, you know, it's not being lived in by your parents. The lineal ascendants and descendants are disallowed, so they're not allowed to be in there. But when it comes to what your IRA, what your IRA can and can't invest in, the IRS doesn't tell you what you can invest in, they just tell you what you can't, and it's a very short list. It's, it's uh, life insurance, contracts, and collectibles. That's it. Everything else is pretty much fair game. So basically, you can own real estate as long as you're not getting personal benefit from it um, outside of your IRA, and that, and that personal benefit extends to your ascendants and descendants. Is that correct? Well, 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 well stated, yeah. Great. Julie's got a great question for Matt and Amanda. Uh, Julie's question is, she recently heard from someone that you have to have six properties to be able to claim the real estate professional designation. Uh, she thought it was time dependent, not property dependent. Matt, Amanda, can you answer that for us? Yes, and you are very smart, Julie. Um, that's exactly correct. There, there's no number of properties limitations. Uh, I mean, you know, what if what if you own the multifamily that's just you know one property with you know 200 units, for example, right? So the requirement there's actually two requirements that the IRS looks for uh, to determine if someone qualifies as real estate professional. The first is that you have to spend at least 750 hours in qualified real estate activities. And there's a whole long list of what qualifies. It's you know, property management, looking for properties, doing the due diligence, doing any accounting, bookkeeping, learning about it, 
um, all those things. So 750 hours total for the year. The other requirement is that you have to spend more time in real estate than you do at your other jobs or businesses combined. So what does that mean? Well, that means if you're, let's say you're someone who doesn't have any other jobs or businesses, um, as long as you spend 750 hours in real estate, you're good. You qualify as a real estate professional. Now, if you're someone who works, let's say, part-time and you work 1,500 hours a year, that means you have to have at least 1,501 hours in real estate and you would qualify as a real estate professional. If you're someone who works full-time at a job, let's say 2,000 hours, uh, then you have to have 2,001 hours to qualify as a real estate professional. The other thing that's commonly overlooked is that uh, the real estate professional status could be claimed by either husband or wife. Okay, so if you're someone who's working full time at a job uh, and you have you know a few properties that you're investing in, but your wife is a stay at home, well, the strategy would be to have your wife try and qualify as a real estate professional. As long as one of you qualifies, both of you get the tax benefit. So you can use the real estate loss to offset your uh, W-2 income. And I say wife, but, you know, obviously it could be a husband who's, who's the one that's stay at home and the wife is working full time. So, When I'm doing uh, personal investment strategy consultations with our clients, very oftentimes I'll see a very high income uh, person married to someone who's making a lower income and, when they, and they own property. And sometimes when I help them do the math of, if that lower income uh, spouse quit their job and just did 750 hours of real estate activities, they would actually make, or I should say keep, more money because they get to claim that tax shelter and the reduced cost of commuting, the reduced cost of childcare, the reduced cost of um, you know, meals away from the homes, et cetera, that they wind up saving more money by quitting their job. Yes, and we see that you know we see that all the time. A uh, common scenario is they'll say the you know maybe the, the one of the spouses will say, eh, you know what, I'm not I'm not interested in real estate. Uh, you know, um, my significant other does real estate. But when you show them the numbers, and all of a sudden they say, oh, you know, I can quit my job and have more money. So yes, now I'm interested in real estate. Well, we've uh, come up to the end of our hour together, and I really appreciate everyone for being on this call. If we did not get to your question, feel free to send us an email directly to the faculty you think would best answer that uh, question. If you like today's webinar, the best way to say thank you is to tell a friend. Uh, we do these webinars uh, quite frequently and really encourage you to share this educational resource with your friends and family.